Hello and welcome to Smith and Sheridan on Biotech, a podcast on the science and business of biotechnology, presented by myself, Cormac Sheridan. And me, Andy Smith. Hello, Cormac. How are you? I'm good, Andy. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Today, we're going to talk about radio pharmaceuticals. Um, a hot, pun intended, Ooh. topic in the biopharmaceutical industry at the moment. There has been a string of deals, both M&A deals and also private equity deals over the last few years. I mean, it's an area that's been sort of bubbling, I dare I say, fermenting for maybe a decade or so when some sort of field establishing acquisitions were done by people like Novartis in particular. They made two key acquisitions of advanced accelerator applications and endocyte, both of which resulted in approved therapies, Lutathera and Pluvicto, respectively, which especially Pluvicto is a prostate cancer drug has been really successful business. It's kind of tracking to sort of blockbuster sales now. The last disclosure was in third quarter of 2023, they had sales of $256 million. Lutathera, which is for somatostatin receptor positive gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, or GEPNETs, it's also quite a successful product. It's, again, Q3 23 sales of $159 million. Again, it's obviously a much smaller market. And these were big acquisitions. Novartis paid $3.9 billion to acquire advanced accelerator applications. They paid $2.1 billion to acquire Endocyte. Before that, more than a decade ago at this point, Bayer paid $2.9 billion to acquire Algata in Norway, who had um, this product called Zofiga, which was actually just a, a radium salt that homed to the bone and was originally, I understand, only intended to relieve pain in palliative care settings for prostate cancer patients who had bone metastases, but then they actually saw a survival signal. But it detained $400 million in peak annual sales. That was back in 2017, but it's, it's trailed off since. It hasn't really hit the sort of $1 billion sales that one point buyer was projecting if they were able to extend it from the original indication. And obviously, Ray's Bio more recently was acquired by Bristol Myers Squibb for $4.1 billion or $3.6 billion if you net out their cash. And that was for the lead program there was a drug RYZ101, again, in development for GEPNETs. And it has this alpha emitting particle, actinium-225 isotope, conjugated to a peptide that targets the somatostatin receptor 2. That's a a very quick skip through. And obviously, Lily bought point biopharma as well, I should mention mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. both for phase two products in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer and also in GEPNETs. There were very similar sort of strategies people are using, very similar targeting agents, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of kind of commonality in the field. I know that you're a bit of a skeptic about how big this is going to play out in the long run. There's certainly Something of an m a feeding frenzy is probably too strong a term. What's a milder version of a feeding frenzy? Um, uh, uh, modality du jour. How about that? <laughs> modality du jour. So it's kind of like a sort of a, a cocktail party with canapes. Yeah, um, yeah. Equivalent, yeah. Only they, they, they emit radiation, though. <laughs> And obviously, and I know you were digging back into the past in this, and those of us d'anage certain, if we're <laughs> maintaining our little bit of pigeon French, will remember Zevelin and Bexar. I mean, I know things go back further than that, but if you like, that's the sort of starting point of commercial pharmaceutical products with attached radioisotopes. But what did they do and how did they play out? Well, obviously, we briefly mentioned it. That they emit radiation. That certainly, alpha and beta radiating emission has been used in cancer therapy long before there were biotech companies even. And it's strange, isn't it? In the era that combines the two now, we have prostate cancer and neuroendocrine tumours as being the ones that are addressed most by these sort of modalities. And to, just to add an additional point to your commentary, uh, Cormac, the chief executive of Novartis announced that in an interview at the recent JP Morgan conference that, no, 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 he wasn't that interested in antibody drug conjugates, but he is much more interested in radiopharmaceuticals. Which is a bit of a misnomer in some respects because, uh, okay, fair enough, you don't have to have an antibody drug conjure labelled with a radionucleotide, but some are. 
as you've talked about with Bayer's acquisition of Algeta, you only have to be a radionucleotide. But that's yeah, that was commercially unsuccessful, largely because, I mean, it does a reasonable good job because radium-223 accumulates in bone. So that's a good reason why it needed to address bone metastases. But uh, overall, you're less likely, I think, now to see free radionucleotides, but you'll see them conjugated either to peptides or to antibodies. And when you talked about prostate cancer, you know, a lot of the antibody fragments or the peptides or the antibodies uh, target PSMA, yeah. an antigen associated with prostate cancer. And for many years, PSMA was a cancer antigen looking for an indication or looking to be more. And radiopharmaceuticals, amongst other things, seem to have now provided that. And that's great. You know, but you know, my skepticism towards the radiopharmaceutical area is not that it doesn't work. And not that it can't work for a certain sector of patients, but because logistical issues of A, getting a prescription for that and getting it filled. And you remember when we talked about the car T's and we said, these aren't things you can go to your medicine cabinet in the bathroom and take a tablet out and take it orally. Radiopharmaceuticals need a radiation source or a cyclotron to prepare them. And they don't come cheap. And they don't come small either. So you have to either have a relationship with the facility. And, and some of the acquisitions you've been talking about, they're actually been bought for their supply chain for radio pharmaceuticals. But to illustrate this whole thing of the logistical issues, not just a specialist oncologist can't then prescribe these drugs. They have to refer the patients to a radiation oncologist. In the dim distant past, a radiation oncologist used to be the, and I apologise to physicians in advance, because I'm a microbiologist, they used to be regarded in the same sort of dowdy area as microbiologists and dermatologists, you know, not the most <laughs> exciting area of medicine. So you refer to a radiation oncologist and a radiation oncologist sorts out a prescription. The actual product has to be made because these are short half-life active ingredients of the drugs. Yeah. So you actually have to synthesize it and then coordinate a patient going to that center where they're kept. And it's not yep. in the bathroom medicine cabinet. It is in a lead-lined area and prescribed mm -hmm. those. And, and the early days, the higher energy alpha emitters, patients had to be isolated. You don't want to get someone standing next to a young kid who's emitting alpha yep. radiation. But beta radiation, much lower penetration. Alpha radiation has a very short path length so that it doesn't travel great distances. And that's why people are going for that now, particularly with actinium-225, because... Yep you don't get as much off-target damage. It really only hits about one or two cells at a time. But it depends on, A, yeah. where the tumour is. So yeah. if it's bladder cancer or skin cancer, well, even worse. Yeah. But they're not in those indications yet. Yeah. And it also depends on how the product is excreted, if it's an antibody or it goes out of the urine. It's probably more precautionary than anything else. But yeah. you don't want to be standing next to someone emitting yeah. alpha radiation, even if you're only yeah. two or three millimetres away. So, you know, like car -Ts we talked about, yeah. It's not your normal pharmaceutical. And yeah. we've seen companies investing in the supply mm. chain and mm. the preparation mm. of these radio pharmaceuticals. And we talked about this before. It reminds me of the Eurotunnel approach to big capital expenditure. The Eurotunnel was decades too long, late, and billions of pounds or euros overspent. And we've seen something similar where we had a couple of companies, when I was coming to the end of being an investor, IPOing, uh, building their own cyclotrons to irradiate their cancers rather than uh, pharmaceuticals. And again, they had the Eurotonal effect. They were tens of years too long than forecast, and they kept on raising money because it cost more and more. So you can see these things aren't cheap to produce, they aren't easy to produce, yeah. they aren't easy to prescribe. So lots yeah. of limiting factors, I think, and will perhaps crimped radio pharmaceuticals. Meanwhile, momentarily deflected by the prospect of the channel tunnel actually doubling up as a particle accelerator. <laughs> oh, I don't think it's in a straight line. Have you ever been in it? it, it not, not for I that have, long. I have, but yeah. not for a while. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. And you could argue that Novartis are the people who probably are best able to comment on all of the foregoing. They had major supply constraints with Pluvicto. They just couldn't make enough of the stuff. And yeah. so the 256 million reported for quarter three, they now claim to be back up to speed. Um, they've invested in some new production facilities and they claim they no longer have supply constraints. But I'm wondering, were there some sales that could have been booked in Q3 that weren't booked? And more importantly, how many patients lost out on this therapy or had their therapy interrupted? Back in the earlier months of 23 and 22, it was uh, 
very problematic, mm. very, very problematic. I, I'm um, sure I'm sure there were sales that were missed or patients that weren't treated. And again, yeah. you know, this is another feature of these advanced therapies. They don't go to the first line patients with prostate yeah. cancer. They go to the later yeah. line patients with yeah. limited lifespan. So there's that aspect to it. But I think but, 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 but just to interrupt you, I think that... Novartis is gunning hard to get Pluvicto into first-line therapy. They've reported phase three data where they do claim, I think it's progression-free survival benefits. I'm not sure I've seen the numbers, but they're gearing up for filing in first line this year. And that would, if achieved, and if they can deliver, that would be a real kind of coming of age for the field. I mean, it would really up the ante considerably in terms of the size of that sort of product franchise. Yeah, there are venture capitalists listening at the moment who are then going out to draw up plans to to build their own cyclotrons to supply the... <laughs> but I do like your a description. And, and Feeding Frenzy is an apt description. We've seen this in the pharmaceutical yeah. sector and biotech sector before. Yeah. When a biotech company or a pharma company in particular takes on themselves a particular treatment modality, whether it's radiopharmaceuticals or you and I both go back to remember inhaled insulin. Do you remember the Pfizer and Snoff? It was going to be, be a oh, great yeah. gift for mankind. From the next mankind. big thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. where is it today? Absolutely nowhere. So we have yes. to be careful of that. And yes. there were inhalation issues, FEV1 decline issues with yep. inhaled insulin, but that's... The inhaler was a, a very chunky piece of kit. It wasn't yeah. like a, a Ventolin inhaler. Yeah, it was but quite, even the Mankind yeah. one was not, yeah. you know, that was the much smaller, yeah. not successful. But yeah. it, we've seen these things where the sector gets ahead of itself. Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm wondering whether the brouhaha with radio pharmaceuticals is, yeah, I'd like it to be true. I'd like every first line uh, prostate cancer patient including our king to be treated with uh, radio pharmaceuticals but um, i hasten to add your king my not king our, not, yeah, yes yeah i'm it, talking it, to it, the it, english um, listeners yeah, rather I'm, than I'm, the irish i'm a proud citizen of a republic um anyway that's another hand there i take your point because i mean zevelin and bexar may have had a superior efficacy to rituximab one of the great workhorses in lymphoma but rituximab rituxan as it was known in the branded mm. form it won out because it was as you say it, it just was uh, much easier to administer far less hassle and it did a pretty good job yeah and it's fair to say that the field of prostate cancer, whether it's first line or later line, certainly first line, has developed with a number of products in the last few years. Some of them now are even generic. So it's much better treatment options for prostate cancer. But you might say that Rituxan, a dumb antibody or a naked <laughs> antibody, to actually outperform the, the state of the art of a radio labeled antibody is a bit of a backhanded insult, if you like, to radio pharmaceuticals. But yeah. the same may be true of We've seen it in other cases. We've seen it in multiple myeloma when the chemotherapy treatments were horrible. But then we've now got much better agents now, even antibody fragments for multiple myeloma. So I think based on the expensive aspect, the logistical issues, if the treatment of prostate cancer continues to advance, mm -hmm. we'll probably find things that could come up against mm -hmm. radio mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals in either prostate cancer or, or neuroendocrine tumors yeah. that are much easier yeah, so if you're given the option, take this pill or go and see that boring old radiation oncologist in the next city and then get yourself sorted for your know, wait for the radio fight. I think I'd go for the tablet. But it all depends on the data, right? I mean, yeah. if yeah. The, the radio pharma people are going to have to publish data that says this is the best in class, this beats standard of care. And I know that, say, as per usual, of course, the data are very slow to come out, but um, there have been, I mean, obviously, Lutathera in particular and Pluvicto, they have demonstrated survival improvements. There's no doubt about yeah. that. But I think, too, though, that we're getting an awful lot of the sort of Me Too radio pharmaceutical plays. And I, I think it's worth giving a shout out to some of the private equity funded companies who are looking at some other targets. For example, Ratio Therapeutics this week raised 50 million in Series B funding. They've raised over 90 million in total. And they are targeting fibroblast activation protein with a, a small molecule that is attached to a chelator that binds actinium-225. And their lead indication is going to be soft tissue sarcoma. Now, they're not the only people targeting FAP, but they're one of the few. 
Their IND filing won't be till later this year with the aim of treating patients early next year. I think that's an interesting one because the fibroblast activation protein is kind of expressed on soft tissue sarcoma cancerous cells, but in other many other epithelial-derived cancers, it's expressed in the stroma. And it's present in large quantities, not in the cancer cells, but in the cells that actually physically support the tumor. And using a beta emitter, which would have a, a wider field of radiation, and probably murdering the terminology there, you will cause more adjacent damage. Mm. And I actually spoke with their CSO this week, John Babbage, and he said, you're not hitting the eggs, you're hitting the nest. Um, and that way, the eggs get destroyed the eggs being the cancerous cells. That's an interesting strategy. And another company I spoke with some time ago, Abdera Therapeutics, which had raised a lot of cash. They went out last year with $142 million raised in across an A and series A and B rounds. They're engineering camelid heavy chain only antibody fragments that are targeting delta-like ligand three for small cell lung cancer. Now that's an interesting approach. And Again, IND filing in 2024 was their plan. So there's things happening yeah. outside of the GEPNETs and outside of prostate cancer. Yeah. And, and as you say, you know, certainly some of the more recent radionucleotides, actinium-255, it, its tissue penetration is only a few cells thick. So you yeah. won't yeah. have yeah. the issues you had. I mean, I don't know, but I imagine patients would be able to go home after a dose of that, as long as it's not excreted anywhere yeah. Uh, yeah. and it accumulates in the tumour. So yeah, as you say, I- things are progressing. But as you said too, though, about the supply chain being one key parameter that's kind of external to the clinical encounter, but it's it's really key to making that encounter possible. But within the patient, the pharmacokinetic story as well is complex and very important because as you were referring to it, how these drugs are excreted and how long they stay resident in the bloodstream are key parameters. Yeah, and, and that, if, that is really important, Cormac, because yeah. with really good efficacy in pharmaceuticals comes some toxicology. These are not risk-free agents either. No. So no. we've seen myelosuppression. We've seen other issues associated, not mm-hmm. the same sort of secondary cancers you see with CAR-Ts, but you've seen the effect of off-target radiation, if you like, either yep. in excretion or in these target site and other sites. Bone marrow and kidney would be two very yeah. vulnerable points. If there's rapid excretion through the kidneys and the urine, you're getting a blast of radiation at your kidney tissue, and, which is not a good yep. idea. And on the one hand, people would say, well, that's fine. We can monitor for all that. You know, we could do liver yep. kidney function tests. And that's true. But then it just adds to the cost. You've got to monitor the patients every five minutes for those. And I'm sure a patient treated with a radionucleotide, when their samples go to the lab, they're going to have a label over them that said radiation treated. And that's going to cost more as well to do that. And Racia Therapeutics have this interesting technology that's very simple. They have this technology, their name for it is uh, Trillium. And it's essentially an albumin binding agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, they say, gives them sort of tunable pharmacokinetics that they can decide how long the blood residence time will be in order to optimize the exposure of the tumor to the radiopharmaceutical. But the albumin binding piece, its affinity for albumin is like a thousand fold less than the affinity of their targeting agent for fibroblast activation protein. So that's why, say, that there, it optimizes delivery to the tumor environment. It's not designed to stay in the bloodstream, but it's just to ensure that you don't get rapid excretion through the kidneys first. Mm. Well, obviously, they have to deliver the data, but there's some interesting people involved because there's some history here. The Racio Therapeutics founders, John Babbage and Jack Hoppen, were both involved in Norea Therapeutics, an wow. earlier acquisition by Bayer, wow. a- amount not disclosed. Um, I don't think it was in the billion mark, but I do not know. Well, clearly it um, wasn't enough, right? So because yeah. they wouldn't have had to go and form another company. Well, I, I think these serial entrepreneurs, they just have an appetite for doing it. And I think a shout out as well to Peptidream has been a key technology enabler here as well. Um, they had a deal with Raise Bio, among others, and Bicycle Therapeutics plays a similar role. Yeah. They provide these peptide molecules that you can basically bolt on anything you like because they're very good at the chemistry of peptides and you can engineer them in any which way. So these are particularly good at developing sort of... Uh, targeting agents that you can easily snap on a, a, a K later. Yeah. The two bicycle therapeutics transactions last year that involved radio pharmaceutical companies. Now that really, I mean, did a good job at rescuing bicycle from the wilderness, if you like, because yes, they have these peptides that you can mimic 
like antibodies or the, the FAB part of antibodies, but they've got short half-lives outside of whatever tuning you can do or prolongation things you can pap on. So, but bicycle therapeutics was largely left for dead in 2023. And they were sort of... Um, they got defibrillated, if you like, by a couple of deals where the radio pharmaceuticals came along and did transactions with them. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. And looking ahead, I do think the Novartis experience this year with Plavicto is going to be a key moment for the field in terms of its development. And wider to that, the securing of reliable scalable sources of actinium-225 is going to be very important. And that hints to our earlier discussion where you've got to have the supply chain, you've got to have the the people to do that. And we are seeing this even in our discussion, not just with CAR-Ts that are Mm. difficult to manage logistically and produce, but now also with radio pharmaceuticals because of the reasons we talked about. But also the aspect is that if I am wrong, and mm-hmm. these radio pharmaceutical agents for prostate cancer and neuroendocrine tumors are much, much more successful than I think they are or will be by resource constrainment. Then we'll come up against the issue we saw with the skinny jabs last year, the GLP-1 agonist, in that the companies won't be able to make enough of them. And so yeah. we, we've seen this a number of times. And I know, you know, a shout out here to the poor people in worldwide drug manufacturing and supply. The commercial people like I used to be, they give you forecasts. They even give you upside forecasts. Mm. And then knock me down with a feather, the drug does even better. And you haven't made enough and you get the yeah. blame for it. Again, another daily area of pharmaceutical science, a bit like microbiologists are in medicines or radiation physicians are in, in medicine, is drug manufacturing and supply. Because when they get it wrong, oh, do they get it in the neck? And it's not yeah. necessarily their fault. Yeah, yeah, it isn't. And obviously, particularly with the radioisotopes, there's an awful lot that's outside of, usually outside of your control. And the war, obviously, Russia's invasion of Ukraine hasn't helped and Russia's kind of isolation or or supposed isolation from the global economy and global supply chains, because uh, actinium-225, again, a typical source would have been discarded nuclear waste. And I was told again by John Babbage from Ratio that he says, yeah, there's enough to support phase three programs and one large product franchise. Right now, there isn't enough to support three or four large product franchises that Mm. are commercial scale. But he is very confident that the infrastructure is being put in place, that the investments are being made and that the supply will come. And I had an interesting chat last year with a company in Switzerland called Nuclidium, who are using copper. Because copper is easily obtained from the steel industry and mm-hmm. they're using it both for different isotopes for diagnostic and imaging purposes and for therapeutic purposes. Early stage, haven't raised a whole lot of cash, but I thought that the choice of isotope was distinctive. They're not completely alone in it, but they're a fully fledged all copper play, Kubrick play. Um <laughs> It was a very interesting and distinctive strategy, and they have a clever little manufacturing piece attached in terms of how you actually attach the the copper to your drugs. So they have um, relationships with cyclotron facilities across the US. So I I thought it was quite clever. Still early stage, though. So I think it's all to play for. And I mean, with all your caveats notwithstanding, I mean, people like Bristol Myers Squibb, Lilly, Bayer, Novartis, these are serious companies who've put down serious amounts of cash. And let's not forget, too, I mean, I, a helpful way I always found of thinking about radio pharmaceuticals is that it's internal beam radiotherapy. Yeah, absolutely. Rather than yeah. external beam radiotherapy. Without the damage on the way yeah. in. Yeah. It can reach parts of your body that the external beams cannot. And mm-hmm. and now that said, I mean, brachytherapy is this interesting sort of intermediate yeah. little position where you have these little seeds or beads that are radioactive that are inserted close to where the tumor is. And Yeah, um, and that's typically been with prostate cancer, isn't it? For, yeah. Mo- yeah, for, for many years, for many yeah. years, for decades. Memorably written about by Richard Ford in his Frank Bascom series of novels, towards the end of his life, The Lie of the Land, mm-hmm. he uh, had these and we were getting updates on the character's experience of mm-hmm. brachytherapy for prostate cancer. So the investments have been made, as you say, very often, no, not very often, often, sometimes the pharmaceutical industry gets ahead of itself. Yeah. And it descends on an area, thinks it's going to be big. It doesn't really pan out that way. We don't know yet whether that will be the case in Mm -hmm. radio pharmaceuticals, whether or not they will reach their nirvana of Paris or they'd be stuck in that bloody tunnel (laughs) trying to to find the exit. (laughs) 
still out, just outside of St Pancras, actually. No, I didn't get very far. But yeah, in the journey of radio pharmaceuticals is beyond St Pancras. We're talking about the Eurotunnel now, listeners, so, which runs from London, St Pancras Station yeah. to and St Paris, I think Garden the, Hall. Yeah, the train is still somewhere in the tunnel. Yeah, but, fair enough. But I think that maybe there's a hint of daylight on the horizon and the prospect of derailment. Surely it could not happen. <laughs> well, you're a bit more optimistic than me. I think we're still back in the tunnel. We haven't turned a corner and it's not a straight line. It goes round. So we haven't seen the daylight yet, but I hope it happens. Okay. Until the next time. Thanks, Andy. Cheers, comic. Bye-bye, everyone.